Okay. So today I want to just talk about um, recent paper, my recent paper with Liang Fu. And the title I've written here is shorter than the one that I advertised. Um, it's because I mainly want to focus on this idea of charge transfer gap inversion, which I'll explain what it is very shortly. So let me just briefly outline what the talk's going to be about. So the title of our paper is Quantum Anomalous Hall Effect from Inverted Charge Transfer Gap. The punchline is basically um, we consider uh, we present an extension of the band inversion paradigm to the strongly interacting setting, um, what we know, what we call charge transfer gap inversion. And one of the possibilities resulting from this, as we show in this paper, is that you can get quantum anomalous Hall effect um, basically without any fine tuning. Uh, so I'll first just go over some motivation introduction, then I'll introduce our general theory through studying a toy model. And finally, I'll apply it to some recent experiments um, on AB stacked MOTE2 WSE2. And please feel free to interrupt with questions as I go along. So <clears throat> first, band inversion. Um, it's a very useful unified framework for thinking about topological insulators. Um, and the way it works is basically if you have two bands, two parabolically dispersing bands, um, and they're at, at some high symmetry point, they have some, in, some symmetry eigenvalue that are different. Um, then as you bring them closer to each other and you eventually invert them, you, and you have some coupling between them, spin orbit coupling that opens up a gap, then this can result in topology. So here I've shown the density of states. Here you have an A, some A band and some B band, and they're both spin degenerate. Um, now, if you bring them closer together, what happens is that uh, it's shown in this picture, you basically, uh, they're next to each other, you have some hybridization between them. And what happens is that the spin up band of the A, of the A here gets a non-trivial shared number, say plus one. And due to time reversal symmetry, then the spin down band gets a uh, shared number minus one. And this results in counter propagating edge modes or the quantum spin hall effect. So if you have a finite bulk sample, you look at the edge, you have a spin up uh, chiral edge mode that goes only in one direction and a spin down one that goes in the other direction. And this is again, due to time reversal symmetry. It's not broken in the system. And so you need to have these two modes. And what I want to ask is, can we extend this paradigm to the strongly interacting regime? This, this, this picture so far is purely in terms of single particle bands. Um, interaction does not play a key role here at all. And this is what I want to consider. So now consider again, a similar system, but now instead of being at, having your Fermi energy right in the gap, your Fermi energy is right in the middle of your first band. So this, is, this can be captured, for example, in a two band Hubbard model, an A band and a B band um, at filling N equals one. What happens when you add, so this is what it looks like at zero U, but as you go to large U, what happens is your, your um, A band splits into a lower Hubbard band and an upper Hubbard band, and they're separated by energy U, and your Fermi energy now sits above the lower Hubbard band. Um, and you can think of it as basically you're filling one electron per site of this Hubbard model. And in, in order to like add another electron to a site, you have to doubly occupy it. And that costs a large energy U. Um, but here we also have this B band. And I want to ask what happens if we bring this B band now closer to the lower Hubbard band, um, just as we did for the in the previous slide with the, with the normal band inversion. And what, what can happen when we bring these two bands together? And there's many new possibilities and it is an entirely exciting new setting for strongly correlated physics. 
and the goal of this talk is to highlight one possibility that can happen in this case, which is you can get the quantum anomalous Hall effect um, without fine tuning. And this is entirely due to what I'll show is universal physics that appears near this gap inversion. So you bring this two together, they, there's some mixing. Um, and the end result is that you end up with a band here with net sure number one. So if you have a finite sample, this basically you, you have one chiral edge mode that goes around and quantum anomalous Hall effect. Um, and I just want to make some quick comments here before I proceed, which is um, in contrast to the quantum spin Hall effect, which essentially um, is single particle, the quantum anomalous Hall effect requires interactions in some way in order to break time reversal symmetry since you have, you have just one chiral mode. And there's also a commonly discussed mechanism for this quantum anomalous Hall that's commonly discussed in like in the Moray materials, which is flat band ferromagnetism. Um, now our theory does not rely on any of these flat bands. I just want to make that clear from the start. Okay, so now let me tell you about charge transfer insulators. Um, so let me just define what they are. So if we have a system, say here is a honeycomb lattice um, with two sub lattices A and B, red and blue, uh, we consider just a strong Hubbard onsite interaction, U at times N up and down, and some sub lattice potential delta. Um, if we were at filling n equals one electrons per unit cell, then the ground state manifold is the set of states that has one electron per A site or per red site here. And to add an extra electron, you can be in one of two different regimes. If delta is larger than U, then it's more costly to put an extra electron onto the blue site. And you prefer to instead just doubly occupy your red sites. And this is, this is what's known as a mott hubbard insulator. If you look at the density of states as a function of energy, um, you have this lower Hubbard band, and then there's a, uh, the next exit, uh, the lowest energy excitations you can make are in this upper Hubbard band, all, all on the A sub lattice. On the other hand, if delta is less than U, then rather than doubly occupying a site, you prefer to put an extra electron onto the blue site. Um, so if you look at this diagram, now the lowest energy excitation above the Fermi energy is this blue band and it's separated by energy delta. And this is all I mean um, when I say charge transfer insulator. Um, now in real materials, this delta, this on-site potential is, is determined by chemistry and it's not easy to tune. But um, what I'll show is that it actually in the semiconductor moray bilayers, are an ideal platform in which you can realize this kind of physics and in which this delta is also easily tunable. And how is that? Well, um, consider the a bilayer of uh, transition metal dash collagenide MX2 um, at a small twist angle, say, then what, what you get is that basically a long wavelength more rape uh, pattern, you get some long distance uh, uh, modulation here of the layer distance, there are three different stacking regions. There's MM, where you have a metal atom on one layer is stacked on top of a metal atom with another layer. Um, XM, where you have an X atom, a chalcogen on top of metal of the other layer, and MX, which is the opposite. And you can see that there's a lot, this long distance modulation of the local environments and layer distance due to relaxation. Um, and if you now just look at, say, the, the first band in this type of system, uh, you can construct some one-year functions and a, ma basically make an effective tight binding model description of, say, the first valence band is what we're looking at here. And you find that it forms an effective honeycomb lattice tight binding model on the Moray scale. You have two orbitals. One is centered at the XM region, and the other one is centered at the MX region. And so they form an effective honeycomb lattice and the layer content is very polarized. So if you look at the XM sites, they're mostly on the top layer, 83% of their weight is on the top layer. If you look at the other one, 83% of the weight is on the bottom layer. So what this means is that we have an effective tight binding honeycomb lattice model 
And if we apply a displacement field uh, perpendicular to the two layers, so you have layer A and layer B, you basically apply a different sublattice potential um, because each sublattice is corresponding to a layer. And so here you have a very tunable sublattice potential. And in the context of the charge transfer insulator that I just discussed, this is, this is a very highly tunable charge transfer gap. And indeed, the, much of this work has is motivated by this recent experiment on um, MOT2WSE2. And here you can see at filling one, uh, as they increase the electric field, they go along here. Um, there's a, this, this window where you go from some strongly insulating state to some window here, which they identify as a quantum anomalous Hall state. If you, you park right here and you look at the RXY Hall um, resistance as a function of magnetic field, you see there's hysteresis and it's essentially the quantized value H over E squared. So, and this is, this is observed in many samples. So they, they've observed robust quantum anomalous Hall in a, some small window of displacement field. And how, how, to, how can we explain the origin of this QAH phase? Well, what I'm going to argue to you today is that this QAH is just arising as a result of universal physics near the charge transfer gap inversion. Okay, so let me give you a, just a brief overview of the rest of my talk, um, which I'm gonna explain in detail all these steps. So first, um, at large delta, we're, um, basically one sub lattice is completely out of the game. All your electrons are on, um, the, the, the red sites here. And the, the state resulting state is a MOT insulator. You have, it splits into two bands, a lower and an upper Hubbard band. They're separated by some energy U. And I'm going to show that these can be well described by some quasi-particle bands here. This is, this is just some picture. Say, suppose there's some quasi-particle band and this captures the lower and this captures the upper Hubbard band. Now, this delta is the energy separation between the, the B sublattice and the A lower Hubbard band. As we decrease this, there's a pair of spin degenerate bands that come down. And as this gap um, closes and becomes negative, then interactions will basically, basically cause some spontaneous non-coplanar magnetism. So here initially, we started with some 120 degree ordered um, magnetic state in plane. As soon as we invert this, what I'll show is that actually this 120 degree order cants slightly in the Z direction and also use develop a, ma a magnetization along the Z direction on the B sub lattice. And the resulting band carries sure number um, plus or minus one, depending on the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Can I stop you a second? Yes. Um, so you said you don't, we don't need flat bands. So maybe it's a good time to ask this question. The first, uh, the first point is that we get a MOT insulator. Yes. So I was naively thinking that we need flat bands for that. Um, so as, as long as the interaction is larger than the, the bandwidth, that's enough to get, um, that's enough to get this MOT insulating phase. Okay, so we need some flatness, a flat-ish, but yeah, I guess yeah. not. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be like, magically, you know, completely flat. Yeah, no. okay. Okay, so let me, let me now just consider a toy model, a very simple model. It's basically a honeycomb lattice tight binding model. Um, and there's some essential terms. Uh, first is on the A sub lattice, HA, there is a tight binding model, just some hopping between uh, A sub lattice. So this is actually a next nearest neighbor hopping. So you go start from this red site, you go, it basically hops along this direction and it's just the amplitude TA. And there's an on-site potential delta. Similarly, there's another ho uh, hopping term for the B sub lattice. And um, for reasons that I'll explain shortly, this term, we also want to have some spin orbit coupling type term, but uh, again, I'll explain that later. And there's also a sublattice potential of the opposite sign. We have HAB, which is a next 
uh, a, sorry, a nearest neighbor coupling that hops between the A and the B sublattice. Um, and finally, we have a Hubbard interaction, UA and UB on the two sublattices. And we want to be, we're focused on the regime where UA is large enough that you get this mod state at large delta. Um, so UA over TA has to be large. Um, and also delta is also large um, so that initially we're filling just the A layer, but then we also want to consider reducing delta to this charge transfer gap inversion. So let me just start off before I go into the analysis, just by some in, with some initial numerics. So we've done Hartree-Fock and DMRG for a particular set of parameters, um, parameter values that are reasonable. And what we find is that um, basically this physics that I showed you happens. So here I'm plotting a bunch of order parameters. So here's the density is the dark red on the A and the B sublattice. There's the Z component of the magnetization and there's an XY component which measures this 120 degree um, order. So you can see that when delta is large, this is DMRG on a cylindrical geometry. When delta is large on the left here, um, there's no Z component. Your N, most of your density is on the A layer and most of it is in the XY, is, is, is in the XY ordered state. And as you decrease delta, the density slowly gets transferred from the A to the B layer. The XY um, order parameter smoothly decreases, but also you see the Z order parameter spontaneously um, increases as well. So this corresponds to starting with some 120 degree ordered phase. As you decrease delta, it basically cans. And that's exactly the physics that I, um, that, that I drew earlier. And we can also confirm that this resulting state um, after the canting is topological by looking at the entanglement spectrum. Um, basically, you put it on a cylinder and you consider threading flux through the cylinder. And by looking at this data, um, you can basically conclude that if I thread flux from zero to two pi, then I have basically pumped one unit of charge from the left to the right of this, of this cut. Is the canting spin degree of freedom or orbital? Um, spin. Okay. So, right. So this is. I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm not gonna explain like uh, exactly what how this works. But this this basically tells you that you have sure number one or minus one. Okay. So now let's now let's try to analyze this problem. So first let's characterize the delta goes to infinity limit. Here, basically the B sub lattice is all the way off to infinity energy, you can ignore it. And you're left with just a triangular lattice Hubbard model on the A sub lattice. At large U, um, multiple numerical works have shown that um, the ground state at filling N equals one is this coplanar 120 degree ordered phase with a square root of three by square root of three unit cell. Um, and the density of states looks like this. You have lower Hubbard band, you have upper Hubbard band. And the one thing I want to focus on is, so now we, okay, so now we want to get a description of this lower Hubbard band. And what I want to focus on is the fact that if you have just one hole doped into the system, it's actually itinerant. So to motivate, let's consider this simple picture where you just have spins in a product state. They're just um, in this one turn degree order and you have a single hole in the middle. And you can ask, what is the amplitude for this hole to hop to a neighboring site? Well, to hop from here to here, you just have to move this electron um, here. This amplitude comes with, this is a hopping amplitude TA. But now once it's hopped, this is actually not in the ideal configuration because you see that the spins want to be anti-parallel, but there's some, there's some, it's parallel with some of the spins now. And so you've got to flip it back in order to go back into this uh, 120 degree order background. Um, but because of frustration, you see that this spin only has to flip um, 120 degrees, and this, this has a finite overlap, um, as opposed to, say, if you had a nail state, everything's anti-parallel, then actually in this limit, a hole would not be able to hop. But we see that thanks to frustration, a hole is indeed um, able to hop with finite hopping amplitude, even in this limit where 
basically all the spins are frozen in this one change degree ordered state. And to make this more concrete, we can use, um, we'll use a hartree fock theory and also confirm this with, uh, confirm this picture with a direct calculation of the spectral function. So um, this, this one train degree ordered phase, it breaks translation symmetry, um, but it still satisfies the special symmetry that involves translation by one lattice um, vector, but also accompanied by a spin rotation. So we can actually utilize this um, so that we don't have to like shrink our Moray, our Brillon zone down to a square root of three by a square root of three uh, smaller Brillon zone. So we can use a unitary transformation that will actually transform this uh, one train degree order phase to a XY ferromagnet. Um, and this basically, the way it acts on the operators is basically as a spin dependent momentum shift. So you have some spin up at K gets mapped to K minus big K. Uh, and spin down at K gets mapped to K plus big K. So here, let me show, I'm showing you the bands. Ignore the blue bands for now. These are at Delta goes infinity, the blue bands are all the way up. So we just look at the red bands. This is the original band of the non-interacting triangular lattice model. Now, uh, once we apply this momentum shift, um, this, this used to be spin degenerate, but we, we see now that the spin up band is now shifted to K and the spin down band is now shifted to K prime. And now we can consider a spontaneous uh, XY, um, XY ferromagnetic order. In hartree fock this just corresponds to a large, essentially mean field in the, in the XY plane. And this is your resulting uh, hartree fock band. Uh, and if you, but because the momentum shift, if you look at this state at gamma, for example, you have one maximum, which I want, to, which is what I want to focus on, this band maximum. It's actually a sum of a spin up electron at the minus k valley and a spin down electron at the k valley. So it's a coherent superposition of, of, of two electrons at different momentum. Okay, so this is this feature, this maximum is what I want to focus on. And I will, um, because it's going to be imported in the band inversion. And I just want to confirm that this quasi particle picture indeed works well. So we use what's known as variational cluster perturbation theory to estimate the spectral function, the density of states, the function of energy and momentum. So at, at u equals zero, this is, this is the original non-interacting bands. Um, now we, we go to large u, and here I only show the lower Hubbard band. There's an, another band that's way up at higher in energy. Here's the only the lower one. And you can see that the up spectral function has this well-defined peak at K prime. And the down spectral function has this well-defined peak at K. And this corresponds to exactly with our understanding that this peak should be some equal superposition of spin up at K prime and spin down at K. Um, but these are not two different maxima. They're really just the same band maximum. And if we, we, so we can do this shift and you see that there's just one peak at, at gamma. And this, this quasi particle peak in, in fact is completely um, in agreement with what hartree fock uh, predicts. Okay, so now the stage is set. We have this lower Hubbard band and whole excitations at least near the band top um, can be well described by some quasi particle band. And so now we can incorporate the charge transfer band or the B sub lattice. And there can, of course, like the position of the minima is, um, is, a, is a freedom. We, it can be anywhere. But for now, let's focus on the most interesting case, which is um, when the charge transfer band minimum also coincides with the Hubbard quasi particle band maximum. Um, and this is actually what happens in the realistic material that I'll talk about at the end. But basically that means we want a spin down band minimum, I mean, spin up at band minimum at the K prime point and a spin down band minimum at K. And this is captured and we need both of them because of time reversal symmetry. And this is captured by basically having an, a spin orbit coupling term on the B sub lattice hopping. And you choose this phase phi B to be four pi over three. Um, and, and so, so after we shift, uh, we do this momentum shift 
everything goes to gamma, what, what we're left with is this, this kind of band structure. And I want to focus on this low energy part and see if we can come up with a low energy description of, of this band inversion as we tune the charge transfer gap down to zero. But what, what is the flux? Um, so this is, so uh, this four pi over three. Um, so, right, so, um, so it corresponds. Oh, it's, okay. it's a spin. It's a spin orbit coupling. Yeah, term. it's a spin orbit coupling term. Yeah, so it's a spin dependent flux, and um, uh, so it's not real flux. It's just like in the relativistic picture of the electron, whatever uh, induced by electric fields or the other ions or something. Um, well, I mean, so the or the precise origin of this of this of this flux. Um, we, we don't really care about that. Okay. Um, uh, I, this is just a toy model and I just want to do the interesting physics here, but actually in the, in the, in the TMD bilayer, the origin of this flux comes from the fact that you have um, one sub lattice comes from like the one layer, the other one comes from the other layer. And because of the relative shift or relative, um, the, the fact that the K points map onto different points in the Moray-Brillon zone, this means that as effectively you have um, some flux as you hop. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, ho ho hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to talk about that later. Um, but in terms of a type binding model, this, is, this corresponds to just some spin orbit coupling term. Um, okay, so I want to focus on this low energy description near the charge transfer gap inversion. Um, so the effective theory basically has a non-interacting part and some interaction terms. So let's, the non-interacting part is given by this. So we have three bands. We have one, which is a parabolically dispersing band that goes downwards. This describes the whole quasi-particle down there. And we have two um, particle bands that are, have some energy offset delta, and then they parabolically disperse upwards. And we also have some interlayer coupling, uh, sorry, some inter sub lattice coupling. Uh, the strength is uh, lambda here is proportional to TAB, this A to B, this nearest neighbor hopping in the type binding model. Um, and importantly, it takes a P wave form. So this is lambda times K plus or K minus, K plus minus is just KX plus or minus or I KY, for kind of either. Um, and that's because this. Right, and that because, that's because the band inversions used to happen at K and K prime, but then we shifted everything to gamma. And so that's why it has this P wave form. And these three components are the A quasi-particle band, the B up and the B down. And the interaction term G here is proportional to UB and it, it's an interaction between the B up and the B down electrons. Okay, so these are all the key ingredients we need. Um, a whole quasi-particle band, a spin degenerate pair of electron bands, P wave hybridization, and an interaction term. Okay, and so proceeding on with these ingredients, um, let's consider the G equals zero, the non-interacting band structure as a function of delta. Um, as delta, if delta is greater than zero, uh, then basically the, the lambda term here, you can ignore, and you basically end up with, uh, just two massive bands, there's a gap, little delta. Um, when you tune delta equals to zero, at exactly zero, you have this um, special point where you have a, a parabolically dispersing band in combination with the Dirac cone. Uh, and as now, as you turn delta to be slightly negative within some window, there's actually a window, there's actually a region here where you have a quadratically quadratic band crossing. So these two bands come down and they touch precisely at the Fermi energy. Um, and as you further decrease delta beyond, then you go, you're, you're sort of over inverted. You end up with this type of state where you have now have electron and whole Fermi surfaces. But there's always a finite window here where the band structure exhibits a quadratic band crossing. And that's what I want to focus on because um, 
uh, this this interaction term uh, g is actually marginally relevant at this quadratic band crossing in the rg sense. So what that means is that um, if you if you focus on this and you turn on any arbitrary g, some arbitrarily small repulsive g, as you as you sort of integrate out momentum, you, the, the g will get stronger and stronger and um, in fact, the, that the leading susceptibility of this system uh, is towards a topological gap where it will open an SZ, it will have a non-trivial spontaneous SZ expectation value. Um, and this gap will be, so for small g, it'll be exponentially small, but any, any, any g will be enough to open up this gap. And the, the thing about this gap is that it's topological. And how do we know that? Well, this is, a, this is a picture of our state. We see that there's actually C3 symmetry if we rotate about a hexagon center. So you can label each of these states by the C3 symmetry eigenvalues, and they all have different values. And so you can see that before inversion, um, when delta was positive, this red dot was the one that was below that had symmetry eigenvalue e to the i pi. But after inversion, and you open up this gap, this SZ gap, um, you see that your this eigenvalue of the first band here is now e to the plus or minus i pi over three, and the fact that your symmetry eigenvalue has changed um, implies that your Schoen number has changed to, in this case, to plus or minus one. Um, right, and this is exactly what we see in Hartree-Fock. So. Um, for, for we can consider say small smaller UB, you see here UB is zero, there's this quadratic band touching. And if we have non-zero UB, you see there's a, there's a gap that opens up here. And this is where this weak coupling RG applies. But, and we can, we can uh, complete, just, just integrate the very curvature over this band to confirm that the, indeed the Schur number is plus or minus one. But actually, this topological phase also persists even to much larger UB. So here, um, UB is actually large enough that like this band, the gap that opens up, actually pushes it way up higher. But still, we end up with this topological phase. You integrate the Berry curvature again, sure number plus or minus one, and this these parameter values are, are also the, like this result is also corroborated by our DMRG, which I showed earlier on the cylindrical geometry. So to the end result that we have is that initially large delta, we have this 120 degree ordered charge transfer insulator. As we decrease the topological gap, I mean, sorry, the, the charge transfer gap, um, they, they come closer together. The, the magnetism changes from in-plane 120 degree to non-coplanar canted order. And the gap here is topological. The net share number is, is not zero. And we have a quantum anomalous Hall state after inversion. And the, set, the requirements for this is actually very, very simple. All we needed was to have a direct quasi particle gap between the lower Hubbard band and the charge transfer band with different symmetry eigenvalues. We didn't need any further fine tuning of um, the shape of the band structure. Uh, it's unlike for topological flat bands where you really need to get the bands to become flat if you want to have uh, ferromagnetism. Now, of course, this we cannot, we of course, we can't rule out the possibility of that there's like other first order transitions to other competing states. But um, assuming that doesn't happen, then this feature is actually very generic in when you invert the charge transfer gap. Okay, so now let me just um, talk, tell you about the recent experiments. So there's this um, AB stacked MOTE2 WSE2. This is a hetero bilayer of TMDs stacked on top of each other because there are different materials they have different lattice constants. So even without any twist angle, you already have a more pattern. And there are sort of three distinct regions, this MAX, MM, XX. Um, again, there's, there's some lattice corrugation as a result of relaxation. This is obtained from DFT. Um, and 
now if you look at the so these are this is the big Brillon zone and the Moray Brillon zone is smaller here and if you look at the um, dispersion okay so in DFT what you can do is you can you can look at a monolayer of MOT2 or WSC2 with the corrugation the lattice corrugation from the relaxed lattice structure of the stacked layer and what this does is it'll capture sort of the the moray potential within a layer while um, separating out the bands from each layer and also the interlayer tunneling. So here's what the MOT2 bands look like. This is the first valence band. And so we know that we said there's a K valley band maximum here and a K minus K valley um, over here. Um, and there's then, then the WSC2 band is now much lower. And that's just due to chemistry. They're just different materials. So there's an intrinsic energy offset. And this is what we call delta. Now, um, now and, and, and initially, so initially, um, the, if, you, if you consider filling, say, the first two bands, you, you all, you, all the bands are in MOTE2. WSC2 is completely out of the game. But as you apply a displacement field, uh, here D is zero, but then now you apply 0 0.3 um, displacement field, you see that there's another band that comes up here and there's some, some feature here that looks like band inversion. And this band that comes up is a, the WSE2 band. It's moving up because you're applying a displacement field, which changes the layer potential. Um, and this DFT band structure can be very well captured by a continuum model um, approximation. And you can see that here, there's a band that's here and there's a WSE2 band that comes up uh, and they, there's a band inversion with a very small hybridization term that opens up a very small topological gap. And you can confirm this uh, you can confirm the gap from the continuum model. So the, you can see that the gap here, uh, it closes and then it, once it opens up, it's, it saturates at around two MeV. And experimentally, this gap can be measured using from compressibility. And it shows very qualitatively similar, um, quantitatively similar actually um, behavior where it goes down. Then after the inversion, it stays at around two MeV. Okay, so this is at this is at n equals two, where interactions are are less important. But now, what about at n equals one? So now we're filling half of the first band, and here interactions uh, are are going to be important. So here's our continuum model for the WSC two MOT two WSC two, and so we want to consider filling only half of these first two bands, um, and here is the tight binding honeycomb model. Again, we because of particle hole transform and um, some other details, there's some momentum shift. But basically, this is our the model that I was talking to you about before. And with just nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor hopping, and there's this phi phase factor. Um, and you see that the qualitative, all the qualitative features of this first band, that this maximum here at k goes down to minimum at gamma and k prime everything's the same, all these features. Um, and for the beast, for the blue bands, there's this, uh, it comes up, there's a small gap that opens. Um, these are all captured in our, in our type binding model. Um, now, of course, if you want the exact shape, like the effective mass and everything, that will require further range hopping. But for the universal physics that we, that we predicted, that shouldn't really, uh, these, these, these things are not, are not important. Um, right, and this is this is again a honeycomb lattice on the Moray scale. It also correctly captures topology. So in DFT, we can directly compute the C three symmetry eigenvalues at the different high symmetry stacking uh, at this different high symmetry momentum points, and this type binding model indeed captures all the correct topology. So from this type binding model, we can now consider um, making the hartree fock phase diagram. What we find is that at large delta, um, there is indeed a mod insulating phase. Um, as we decrease delta, we go into a QAH phase. 
And as we decrease delta, uh, there's also this potential metallic phase here, which corresponds to what I showed earlier, where sort of the bands have been inverted too much and interactions are not strong enough to open up a, a gap. And our argument is that, well, this QAH phase actually like, it's always stable within a small window because the fact that this, as long as the mod insulator is there, um, there's always a window where we have a quadratic band crossing and in which interactions are, are a relevant perturbation. And the gap might become very small, but there's always a window of QAH here. So experimentally, what they see is that they, they, as they increase the electric field, they go from an insulating phase to a QAH phase, and then to this region where, where it's metallic. And so our simple model here already captures this progression of MOT, QAH, metal, even while many factors are left out, such as like further rate hopping, interactions, um, and so on. So, so in order to get things, um, th there could be other effects that, that, that come into play, but already all the main physics is, is captured just by this very simple type binding model on the honeycomb lattice. Okay, so let me, let me conclude. So this charge transfer gap inversion um, that I've been talking about this whole talk is a completely interesting new paradigm for strongly, strongly interacting physics. Um, and in this work, we've shown that given certain general conditions on the quasi-particle dispersion and the symmetries, um, you can actually get quantum anomalous Hall effect quite generically as you tune this um, charge transfer gap to inversion. Um, near the inversion, there's a very simple, interesting three-band universal low energy theory. Um, and in, in this mechanism, interaction actually plays two vital roles. Um, first is producing this initial MOT uh, antiferromagnetic state, uh, the background state on which everything is built out of. And secondly, after the inversion, the interaction plays an important role because it's perturbatively um, relevant and it basically produces this non coplanar magnetism. Now, some final comments, there's some open questions. For example, the, the phase transition, there's a very experimentally relevant question because experimentally they can just tune the phase transition through this displacement field. So what are the properties that we should be looking out for at this phase transition? Um, here we've only focused on one particular setup. Uh, I showed you, we have like this charge transfer band is coming down at exactly the right positions to get a, to get a band inversion, but there's also many other possibilities. and and again, this charge transfer gap is just a general framework uh, with many other possibilities that that deserve deserve future future study. So this is an, exi an exciting, wide open playground for strongly new, strongly correlated physics. Um, and again, thanks to my collaborators, Liang Fu and Yang Zhang at MIT, and the exper experimental colleagues at Cornell, Kim Fai Mac, Jia Shan, and um, their group. Uh, thank you. Questions? Hi, hi. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Jay Wang from the Fred Allen Institute. Thanks very much for the interesting talk. So, uh, may I ask one a couple of questions? Yes, sure. Um, so uh, the first question is about lattice. Um, in some twisted TMD materials, um, the local charge density wave is at triangle lattice. Uh, including right. the WSE2 and also the hetero um, materials. So my question first is um, why your starting point is a honeycomb lattice? Is that tunable by displacement field? So what we find um, in this model is that if you just do, if you look at DFT and you look at the charge density, um, it does form a honeycomb lattice. So the MOTE2, um, if you look at the first valence band, it's centered at the MX, the MM region. And if you look at the WSE2, it's centered at the XX region. The wave functions are very, are localized around this region. Um, I, I, I hope I haven't messed, I, I hope I've, I've picked the correct centers, but um, that's what we find from DFT in the system. And, 
So that's that's why we took it as a as our starting point for the system. Um, so maybe um, the both the hetero and the homo they have a common form of the continuum model, um, but maybe the more real potential can tune the lattice from triangle to hexagonal. Uh, exactly, exactly. Okay. The the in the continuum model there's this phase factor, and that phase factor completely determines what the Mm -hmm. where the, the type binding model, um, the, where the orbital is going to be centered and in, right? And depending on whether the two layers have the same, the same potential minimum, right? Mm -hmm. Then that'll determine whether you have a, a triangular lattice where both of the two layers have the orbital of the same uh, stacking region, or if, if they're on different, then you have a honeycomb lattice. So, uh, the second question is, it, does your theory um, of the charge uh, transfer insulator induced uh, inversion of bento particle rely on the Hanko lattice? Uh, does it work on triangle lattice? Um, it, it should work on the triangular lattice as well, as long as the symmetry properties um, um, Yeah, as long as the symmetries work out, then it should also it it, it, sh it should it, we don't depend on the triangular lattice. Um, I mean, on the on the honeycomb lattice. As long as the low energy theory is, is uh -huh. the same. So the yeah, symmetry, I, I, yeah. Symmetry, you mean that the quadratic band can be labeled by their quantum numbers and exactly splitting that is uh, independent of the lattice as long as you have this uh, quantum number labeling. Yeah, yeah, okay. and the band inversion is topological. Uh, yeah, that's that's all we need. So my last question is that in your phase diagram, you have an insulator, quantum anomalous hall, and the metal. So insulator, I think, is a magnetic insulator which corresponds to the one hundred twenty order, uh, yes. one hundred twenty imprint order. Anomalous hall has canted spins. Yes. Uh, so what is the magnetic picture for the metal? Is a paramagnetic metal or um, what metal? So it is it still um, has 120 degree order. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a 120 degree, but there's no canting and mm -hmm. there's basically electron and hole Fermi surfaces. Uh, so it's a, you don't have a direct band gap, but indirect band, band gap. So you say, you call it the metal. Um, so it, basically you have, uh, the, you have your whole quasi particle band uh -huh. And then now you have some other pockets that are coming down. They come, but yeah. there's two of them that come down. Now, if only one of them was coming down, what would happen is that you have some tunneling and they'll open up a gap. But because you have two of them coming down, the whole, the whole band can only hybridize with one of them and the other one just goes straight through. And so that's why it's it's metallic. Uh -huh. So don't have a band gap in the hydrofog picture. Oh. Yeah, there's no band gap. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yes. Um, so can you explain, maybe you did, in the quantum anomalous hole phase, what is the Chern number for the B bands? Um, so So, okay, so so this, the A band gains a sure number plus or minus one, but the whole thing here is is total sure number zero. So the, the B bands have to gain, a, as a result of this opening gap, the B bands gain up the opposite sure number. Yeah, so my question, so there are two B bands, spin up, spin down, which are related between themselves, maybe by time reversal. I don't know. I'm just guessing. So um, how would you how would you divide this plus or minus one turn number between the two B bands? So, okay. So after inversion, the 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 band. So if you zoom in here, right, you see that this. Although there are two bands here, one of them has has been inverted. So like this this upper band, for example, it's it's red at yep. the bottom here. So 
it's not it's not a full it's not it's not, i wouldn't call it like a fully b band right it's just a it's just a band yeah um uh so one of them will remain c equal zero and one of them will be c equal one i guess right as, as long as they they have a gap everywhere the share number is well defined um in that case the band that would gain the opposite share number is the one that uh is the one here that just the gap so the gap originally there was a quadratic band crossing and when they open up then the two bands that are used to partake in the quadratic band crossing are the ones that pick up the two opposite share numbers um so in this picture i would say it's the bottom band assuming they don't cross anywhere and the the band the share number is well defined i would say it was the lower blue band that has the 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 share number okay Got it. And, and last question. Um, what do you think about um, real, realizing a fractional churn insulator in this uh, um, setup? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't I don't have any. Yeah, I don't I don't have any ideas for how we could realize a fractional churn insulator in this in this setup. Um, yeah, yeah. The way the way to go about that would be, to, yeah. You you'd want flat topological bands in that case. Um, yeah. So we need more flatness, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. You'd need more flatness, and then you can consider fractionally filling these flat bands. In 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 this picture, we're always at integer filling. Uh, bands are not flat, so. At, at least, at least, at this point, I don't see a way that um, we could get fractional shared insulators in this setting. Um, thanks a lot. It was really, really great. Talk thank, about. thank you. Um, there's a question from. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, very interesting uh, finding. Uh, really enjoyed the talk as well. Uh, I have a somewhat of uh, a technical question. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, do you have uh, a handle on the um, a collective excitation gap in the in the quantum anomalous whole phase? Like, so the spin waves I imagine have could could have lower energy than uh, bulk fermions. Um, right. So, so the one twenty degree ordered uh, state breaks uh, continuous rotation symmetry. So there's always a Goldstone mode. Okay. All right. Oh. So, so, so so I, I so i thought you also break the continuous spin rotation by the lattice or so or is that not the case um sorry sorry can can you repeat that is, so there, there's no uh there's no uh, spin orbit or any or any other effect that ties the spin to the lattice here oh um no 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 so right at the, so if, if we consider just the A sub lattice, it's just a Hubbard model. It has the full spin rotation symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, I see. In, yeah, so in the real system, we there there should there could be terms that will break this symmetry down to a in down to a planar just U, spin U one rotation symmetry, um, and in that case, you still have a, there there it would still spontaneously breaks that symmetry. But I don't think that there's anything that specifically um, mm -hmm. breaks this. You won. All right, uh, and uh, another relate also also uh, uh, technical question is uh, about the uh, artery fog. Um, so, do you have a handle on whether uh, other uh, other order parameters could be competing or have a lower uh, lower overall energy or something like this? Uh, like how 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 uh, how reliable is the claim that? That uh, mod uh, quantum anomalous whole phase is the lowest energy. So, in the model we considered, um, so in the type binding model we considered, um, I basically considered. Um, ah, you also have DMRG, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, so we have DMRG, but again, uh, DMRG, yeah, so Hartree Fock agrees with DMRG. In the yeah. Hartree Fock, we, we start from like a different, different initial states, like ferromagnet. Um, XY ferromagnet. There's like two different XY planar antiferromagnets. 
um, we start from all of those as seeds and then um, we basically run it. DMRG, mm -hmm. again, we just start with a, with a product state in the, yeah, in the, right. yeah and, and it still finds this state. So at least in, the, in our tight binding model, we, we're confident that this is the ground state. Now in the real system, there's all sorts of other interactions more there could be something more interesting, more complicated happening. But in our model, we're confident in this picture. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending.